This is the Crease Cast. One final Crease Cast for the month of April, and we're coming off of two games where uh, an, an, end to, an, an end to the month that the Vancouver Canucks would probably like to forget. Uh, two, two straight games in Ontario where, oh, I think saying things didn't go according to plan is uh, an understatement. Um, uh, welcome to the Crease Cast. It is just me today. Cody is off on Comets duty once again. Uh, as we start, uh, yeah, as we start the uh, this episode uh, with the Infinity Blocker, I mean, it's hard to really think about anyone who this could go to, really. I, I, I have a hard time giving it to just about anybody on the ice. And uh, um, aside from, I guess, JT Miller again, I mean, you know, I... Uh, I I don't know if there's anybody. I really don't know if there's anybody. The last couple games, um, oh, you know what? That's not true. There is somebody who to give it to. My, um, that would and that would be uh, Cole Lind, who played his very first NHL game. Uh, that is really about the only person I could think to give it to. I mean, uh, not he didn't have necessarily the most uh like wild like amazing or uh like in terms of like. He he like the craziest debut ever. He didn't you know he didn't blow us all away in in the fir- in his first game, uh, but he had two shots on goal. He had a couple hit. He had a hit. He uh, he played seventeen minutes. He did he did pretty well for a first go around. Um, and it was about time because frankly Cole Lind, uh, based on what the Canucks had been presenting over the last few games, particularly, uh, particularly the game against Ottawa. The, the six to three loss against against the Senators, uh, the Canucks have shown, particularly in that bottom six, that they just do not have it. They do not have the. Uh, they are not up to speed. They're not up to standard to play right now, and COVID is probably a huge reason for that. I don't think that's. I don't think that's a a hot take per se, um, but I do think that uh, it has gotten to the point where this team is clearly gassed. They're they are they are absolutely doing as much as they possibly can, which is not enough. Which is just not going to be enough, and that's fine. Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna harp again. I'm not gonna harp too much on the individual play as much as I am the the general sense of okay, why is this team at this point? Why are we here? Why for all of the things this team has at its disposal? Why can they not? Why are they so depleted? Because in reality, when you think about it, the Canucks are not actually missing too many people right now. Um, they're not missing a whole. There are not a whole lot of players actually on the injured reserve at the moment. Yes, Pedersen is obviously a huge loss, and that's someone that you can't replace. No, no doubt about it. You cannot replace Elias Pedersen. You can only hope you can find enough group offense to uh, make up for him. But aside from that. The only person they're missing, they're really missing right now, is Jay Beagle. And that's a fourth-line center. As, you know, as much of the veteran presence as he brings, there's not a whole... There's not really that much the Canucks are really missing off the active roster. They're they're pretty healthy from a bodies standpoint, from who they actually can put on the ice on a nightly basis. Um, And, again, I am not going to... I'm not going to undersell the fact that COVID probably has made these guys a lot more tired, a lot less, a lot lower energy. I don't think that's, I don't think that's uh, any doubt. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But as far as who they're really missing off the active roster, um, there's not a lot there. There's not a lot missing, which makes you ask the question, well, why are they playing? Why has this gotten so bad? Like, why has it gotten to this point where... You have a you have a team you have a team where they're shuffling in guys from the taxi squad in and out of the taxi squad. Some of which did not get sick. Of quite a few of which didn't get sick, but they just can't even come close to uh, matching the tempo that the guys at the top have been. Like the guys at the top, like the like the top six guys are not doing super well. Granted, but they're able to still keep more or less the pace of play uh, over some time over the over the time. Whereas the NHL, whereas the bottom six guys just can't play at an NHL speed, and 
that is a lot to do, you know, with management and the fact that, you know, they have about six or seven guys who could, who are, you know, rolling into the lineup at, from, uh, on a nightly basis. Like you have Travis Boyd, Mark Michaelis, Matthew Highmore, Jace Howerluck, Zach McEwen, Jimmy VC. list goes on. And then, of course, you throw Tyler Mott and, J- and Jake Bertanen in there, two guys who are playing bottom six, who are on the bottom six, but have, you know, more, but are, you know, cemented there rather than, say, the guys who are who would be jumping in and out of the lineup. And you know, even Tyler Mott got, didn't uh, fare too well in the game against Toronto. He ends up taking a high hit from Timothy Lilligren that ended his night. Uh, and it, for a guy with concussion problems, that's concerning. And it really got to the point of, with the Ottawa game where the question really became, why can't Cole, why, how, how much worse could Colin do? Frankly, like what, and that's such a glim, that's such a, that's such a glib, uh, like way to look at it. But frankly, it's true. Like what could Colin have possibly, what could Colin possibly do that would make them worse? If anything, he's probably going to make them better than whoever they take out of the lineup. Uh, the guy ended up, who ended up coming out of the lineup was Jace Howerluck. I don't know if that was necessarily the best call, but what, uh, the call I would have made at the very least, but, uh, I digress. The... This team is stuck in a position uh, where if even a couple injuries, um, even a couple injuries uh, come up, it can completely decimate their ability to win games. And that was proven in the last couple games where they just can't keep up. There is nothing that that bottom six can do to keep up. They don't have the skill or the speed or to take to or anything for that matter to really put them over the edge which is why it was such a relief to see Colin come in and do okay. He did all right. He had he provided again energy, which is not which is not what uh the ceiling should be. Like that should be a given. But for a guy who's playing his very first NHL game, has little has, you know, AHL experience and a fair amount of it, but you know, has never gotten the opportunity at the NHL level and wasn't going to necessarily get a lot of time with the top 6. Uh the fact that he was noticeable and was making and was creating some chances and was getting some opportunities to maybe come close to putting the puck in the net, uh, matters. That does matter because if he can match that tempo, uh, going forward and they can find more guys who can do so, it bodes better for the team, uh, as they head into this next, as they head into the rest of the, the final, what, 13 games of the season or 12. Am I remembering that incorrectly? I'm sure it's probably, I'm sure I'm close, 13, around 13 or 12 games remaining on that schedule. Um, yes, they have, uh, they have, uh, 12 games left, 12 games remaining on their 56 game schedule. Uh, and, uh, one point behind Ottawa, uh, behind the Senators currently holding, um, last place in the North Division. Uh, now that probably won't hold. Uh, the Senators only have six more games, the Canucks, and the Canucks have seven in hand on them, uh, or six in hand on them, excuse me. So, they should be fine. They, they, they won't finish seventh, hopefully, <laughs> but, um, it does kind of, there, it does definitely cement the fact that, um, the, the, the playoff, the playoff aspirations are over, and I hate, and I hate that. That's too bad, because, Again, this division is such a, a crapshoot that it is possible that teams who shouldn't be in the race in a normal year are still going to have a good chance at cracking that last spot. Technically, they're still in it, but it's not going to be for much longer. And Montreal is definite that 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 a uh, twelve point gap between them and the Habs is going to be very difficult to make up in twelve games. You got to be averaging. You got to hope that. What you do better than five hundred, and you have to hope that the Canadians lose every single game for the rest of the year, pretty much, uh, just to get there. So you're running out of your the runway is very clearly running out, and at the very least, you just hope that they can do their best at this point. Again, like no one is going to expect this team to tank because there's nothing really to tank for. Um, there's nothing, and there's. There's no real benefit for this team at this point and where they're at to make some magic run into the playoffs, especially considering how gassed this team looks. Do you really want them if to play another potentially four or seven games? 
uh, just to cook them even more for uh, before next season when I think it's I think I would argue that it's going to matter a whole lot more next season. Like this playoff doesn't feel like it matters all too much, and I get that every season matters. Like champion, there's a championship on the line, but I think the fact that there are no fans in the building and there hasn't been all season and there won't be for the rest of the year as far as the Canadian teams are concerned, it doesn't feel like this matters. It very much feels like this is just kind of killing some time and some entertainment time um, before the next season. So there's not really any benefit to having them go out, play four, play four or seven games, get slaughtered by a Toronto or an Edmonton, and potentially risk long-term health of more players. So you just hope that they finish as, as best they can. Like, if the Canucks finish fifth, which it, which I think is entirely doable for them, especially because I don't believe that Calgary is that much better than, although some advanced stats are saying otherwise. Um, I think that's fine. I would be thrilled if the Canucks finished uh, fifth uh, in the playoff, fifth in, fifth in that race, finished as high as they possibly could, and uh, and went into the offseason holding their heads high that they gave it their best effort. And Cole Lind gives them that. Uh, that was a bit of a long turnaround to say that Cole Lind is part of the reason why they're doing all right. But yeah, Infinity Gauntlet uh, for Cole Lind and for the Canucks as a whole, I think that they just doing as best you can for the rest of the year should be the the should be the uh, the the bar to set. Don't set a don't set a a, a precedent of we're going to be easy to play against. We're your, we're a guaranteed win. That's all I think we can ask of these players is just give it your best shot. Do what you can. Find, and for the management and the coaching staff, find the time to bring in some of the players who deserve an extra shot. Like Jack Rathbone. Who's to say that throwing in Rathbone in favor out instead of, uh, say, maybe you give Alex Edler an extra night off or a J- or Jalen Chatfield, who's only playing 12, who only played 12 minutes, uh, the other, who only played 12 minutes against Toronto. Um, why not give, why not give Jack Rathbone the opportunity? He's sitting on the taxi squad ready to go. Let's give him a shot. Let's see what he can do, especially considering his upside and as what his potential is compared to a Jalen Chatfield is much higher right now. I think it's much better off that you give those guys the chance to show what they're made of. Maybe give Jonah Gadjevich a chance, uh, at the end of the season, call him up for a game or two. It would, uh, it would uh, mess with his quarantine, or maybe they just let him finish the year. We we shall see. Um, but you you start giving the opportunity to some of the younger guys who you think have deserved a shot to play in the in the NHL for a couple games and see what they're capable of. Especially in the cases of like Lind of Lind, who uh, of course is potentially has to be exposed in the Vegas in the or Vegas Seattle draft, which of course is uh, expansion draft, which was made official today. The Kraken officially becoming the 32nd franchise in the NHL after making their final whatever hundreds of millions of dollar payment to the league. Uh, a little un, a, a nice bit of chump change uh, in the Canucks pocket, I believe, is something to the like $15, $20 million. That's, uh, that's worth uh, two, a Pedersen and a Hughes contract, I would, I would say. Um, so yeah, that's where the Canucks are at at this point. You have to start giving the opportunities to the guys who can play, especially considering the fact that they're going to be coming in fresh, which has been the biggest problem for this Canucks team of late, is that they are just gassed. There's so many times. We talked, like, the Edler, um, the Edler kneeing incident with Zach Hyman, where Edler and Myers got caught out on the ice for three minutes. That, they're not getting caught out for three minutes necessarily right now, but they're still... A bunch of players who are being who are being uh, hemmed into their own zone for upwards of a minute and a half to two minutes. And keep in mind, the average NHL shift is closer to about forty-five seconds. So, and and that's not good. And that's not good for their for how they're going to finish here. That leads to more injuries. That leads to again more chances of making a bad mistake, like Edler did, uh, clipping Hyman. Um, it le- it opens the door to just a Pandora's box of other of other potential hazards. So it really behooves the Canucks to try and find an opportunity, a reason to give their younger guys uh, the ice time, some ice time. 
Um, and frankly, I personally think it would make them a better hockey team right now. Like, who's going to do be- more for the Canucks at this point? Jack Rathbone or a tired, uh, or a tired uh, Alex Edler, even? Like, and I know that's a bit much, maybe, to say just because of how much uh, Alex Edler... Uh, means to the organization in the in the as a whole, but right now he's clearly very tired. He's playing a lot slower, and I mean, I guess we'll get into the Wayne Simmons incident right now. Um, that whole that whole thing was just abysmal. I was not uh, able to see it myself because I was at work uh, until I got home much later. And you watch the the tape, and you just go like. Mm. Why was this necessary? Like, and so many, and I mean, of course, you get the usual Leaf fans in your, uh, in your mentions, uh, and all over the place making stupid arguments about, uh, how, oh, he got what was coming to him, and this is the code, and blah 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 and how apparently, I guess the two-game suspension isn't enough. Apparently that's not a, that's not the, uh, the actual punishment. He needs to answer for a crime he already... He already answered for uh, Alex Edler, who notorious, apparently dirty player, who's never had a fight in his entire life up until today. Very, very stupid. Or on yesterday, sorry. Very, very stupid. And yeah, just so many people with just garbage takes about how it was deserved and it was coming to him. Um, first of all, the Leafs fan. Leafs are a team that, as far as on paper and the lineup themselves and what they've done and how they've built their team, I quite like. Like, I, I've said this before. I quite like that the Matthews, Marner, Nylander group and the core that they've assembled and how they've gone about doing it with Kyle Dubas and Lou Lamorello beforehand kind of setting the table before Dubas kind of serves the meal, you know, sort of thing. I think that's a really good precedent to set if they can end up turning it into a championship a championship later on that sets a good precedent for, hey, you don't necessarily need to have the same GM who starts building the core, who builds the core, doesn't necessarily have to be the general manager that finishes it off and assembles the final bits and pieces. That doesn't necess- That doesn't always have to be the case. So if Toronto goes out and does something successful, that's great for the sport as far as how they approach team construction. And the Canucks are a team that could really, really learn, really learn that lesson right about now, really could use that lesson uh, <laughs> as far as how they've handled this current regime and how they, and how that regime in turn has handled building a roster around a core of decent players that they've assembled, of great players they've assembled, but just given them the the bottom of the barrel in terms of depth. Um, and I, yeah, I like that team. And I always wonder myself, like, why do I like not like these guys? Why do I inherently not like these guys? And then you interact with Leaf fans for about five minutes and you're like, oh, right, this is why. This is why I don't like this team. It's not, it has nothing to do with the team itself. It has entirely to do with the people the very loud, annoying people with terrible takes, just awful, awful takes. Everything is a uh, everything is against the Leafs. It's uh, and uh, and all they can see is everyone is out to get them. And there, there was there was one guy out there who, again, who for the second week in a row, trying to argue that making the galaxy brain take that Alex Edler intentionally injured uh, Zach Hyman. I'm just going to put it uh, as if the BX didn't put it well enough last week when we posted that clip. I'm going to put it, I'm just going to say that in terms of that guy, when I read that, that, uh, that, uh, tweet, uh, and a lot of people went after this guy in the mention, I'm not going to say who it was because I, they don't deserve my, uh, they don't deserve my, uh, a plug from me. I'll say, but I'll say this, that sounds like when you say stuff like that, when you, when you are so set on, no, he intentionally hurt somebody. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like every single dirty player that I've ever uh, encountered in my personal minor hockey career. Every, that is exactly the kind of thing the dirtiest players would say. That sounds like this, that is the person, that person undoubtedly, if they played hockey, was the person who ran around trying to hurt people and used and used the uh i am only out to that everyone is dirty 
uh, because that's the only way of playing that I know mentality to make themselves feel better about the fact that they're going out and trying to, like, take people out of the game and trying to put them in the hospital. So that is, and that is every, I've re- I've seen a lot of players who are like that, and they all had that same mentality. Every, I only know dirty hockey, therefore everyone else must be as dirty as I am, because that's the only way of playing I know. So if that guy really out, really outing himself on that one, uh, if he did play, or at the very least, uh, probably was not the nicest guy to deal with, uh, in school, was probably not the nicest school guy. Um, either way, it, that doesn't really matter at the end of the day, what people's takes on it is. The point of it is that Alex Edler shouldn't have had to answer and, and drop the gloves, uh, with Wayne Simmons for something that he already got suspended for. It just, it isn't necessary. It absolutely should not be necessary. That's the whole point. If, if the guy gets suspended and justice was served, like he doesn't need to, he shouldn't have to go out and defend himself on the ice again. That's a complete load. And the fact that Simmons just wails on him for uh, a couple minutes, for like a minute is completely bogus. And just like, um, it's, it's unnecessary. It was completely unnecessary of him to do uh, a very, very, a very, very goony, Thing, a very, very goony thing, and this is the kind of stuff that needs to be just wiped out of the game. Wayne Simmons is a good hockey player. Like, he shouldn't, like, he's not, he shouldn't have, he shouldn't be out there, uh, just to, like, uh, beat up a guy who already got suspended. Like, that's clearly not what he's, his, that's clearly not the only thing he's good for. He's got plenty of things of, he's got plenty of capability, uh, to play at that level. So, for him to be, for them to, basically using him to like waste like waste his time going out there and fighting and exp- or or if that's how he felt he needed to spend his time that's a huge that's just a load it's just stupid and this is the kind of fights and the kind of mentality in the game that needs to just be wiped out it is the worst it makes hockey less fun for everybody it is not good it is not entertaining to watch a guy get beat up over something uh that they shouldn't need to that already had that already got dealt with it's just pointless and just trying to purposely make a bigger scene than needed and trying to make a big show of being a big man even though there was no reason to have to make that play uh there's no reason for that to happen and yeah it sets the whole tone for that entire game and just how the canucks very much they looked you know lackluster it wasn't there the energy wasn't there lots of open shots i think every single goal uh the the leafs uh put put up against the canucks was kind of an open shot. Like they got, I think there was the knee land, there was the knee lander goal at one point. Uh, I'm just trying as I try and uh, re go back. You know, there's the Matthew, there's the knee lander goal in the first. There's the Matthews one timer, the Pierre Engvall one timer, and then there's a uh, and uh, again two goal those uh, those second two, particularly the Engvall one. I think uh, Holtby would have liked to have back. It wasn't necessarily Holtby's best outing. Uh, but again, even at, even in the later stages, he found ways to kind of hold his team into it because that was all he could do. Thatcher Demko, uh, had a rough night against the Senators on, on Wednesday. And to his credit, I think he did as, he did as best he could given the circumstances. He wasn't getting much help. And for Vancouver, you have, you, the, the gas in the tank's gone. I mean, I don't know what else, much else there is to say. Um... Uh, aside from, like, you're getting the opportunities where JT Miller is still putting pucks in the net, thankfully, he's looked all right. He's been kind of what they've, he's gotten what they've been able to do for the most part. Um, Jake Furtanen had a goal, I believe. Brandon Sutter found a way to put the puck in the net. Uh, Tyler Myers had a nice goal in the first game, in the first game against Ottawa. Uh, but just both of those games, they were, it was, it was over before it began. And as far as the, re- how to, how to handle and approach the rest of the stretch goes, Again, not much else other much not much other than you hope that they can put their best foot forward and try and put their best effort out on the ice because that's that's all they have at this point. It's about it's very much a play for pride uh, rather than the results on the ice because that's that's the best you can really hope for here. Um, and what do they have left, uh, Frank? Well, the good news for them is there's only one more game against Toronto, and that's Saturday night. That's their last game of the year against Toronto, and then you have five more against Edmonton. Uh, you got five against Edmonton, including <laughs> next week, all four games against Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, and the Oilers. Um, games that are technically, I would argue, um, 
I'm not gonna say they're winnable. Like, I'm not gonna say necessarily like, oh, there are games that you absolutely must win. But they're there's capable to take a couple games here and there. I think it's possible. Um, I mean, if you can find uh, the ability to really keep uh, McDavid and Drysaddle at bay, uh, which is the most important part at this point for them. Um, and the Oilers are a team that's looking to try and clinch their officially clinch their uh, their playoff spot. So you have to. Uh, you 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 want to find a way to um, put the fear of God into them a little bit. You want to play spoiler. That's kind of what you have at your at, as your opportunity at this point is. Can you make it? Can you make it more difficult for the teams at the top to make the playoffs and try and really scare them? Put a li- make it a little bit more difficult for them going into the postseason if possible, because that's all there really is left for them to try and hope for at this point. And um, hey, maybe they do make an, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they make a miraculous comeback, but at the very least, you just hope that they put the best effort possible forward. Um, you got two games against Winnipeg. Uh, uh, you have two games left against Winnipeg and four against Calgary. Opportunities to play some spoiler. They're all teams that are kind of just like, I don't want to say hanging on, but they're very much in a, in, they're all vulnerable in different ways. All teams vulnerable in different ways. Can you find a way to maybe unseat one of them and hold your head high on that and be like, hey, we took we took the Jets out of contention or the Flames out of contention or the Oilers, second place Edmonton. Can you manage to, in five games, can you manage to somehow completely sink their season? That's the kind of stuff you have. That's the kind of moral victories you have to, and real ones for that matter, to at, at, as, as you're at your disposal. So that's the kind of stuff that I just want to see from them is can you get the young kids in? Um, can you find a way to bring some uh, healthier bodies in put your best and put your best possible out effort out there? Because I would argue that even in the Toronto and Ottawa games, for the most part, there were a couple moments like where they definitely looked where there was points where it looked like they're not even trying. But again, I think that's just gas. I don't, them being like out of energy, I don't think there's much more you can say from there and it's only going to get tougher from here. Um, So yeah, you just hope that they find the reasons, they find their opportunities to slot in as many of the younger guys as they can, give them the, give them some fresh legs and uh, see what they can do. Artur Seeloffs maybe. Maybe you get Artur Seeloffs in there uh, for one game. Um... Maybe it's that, and maybe it's that uh, that Edmonton game that I'm going to on uh, on Monday. That would be the uh, that'd be interesting. That would be quite funny. we were, uh, I was talking with Cody about that. Like, what if they play? What if Jack Rathbone's debut uh, is against the is against the Oilers on Monday? We do know that uh, as far as right now, Cole Lind will be making his home debut that night. Uh, so we'll get a chance probably to talk to might get a chance to talk to Cole Lind after that. You never know in the. Uh, the media availability, as far as that's concerned. Uh, maybe Rathbone in there, too. Who knows? Maybe it's Seelovs. It's possible. Uh, Michael DiPietro uh, won't be back, but he played a phenomenal game today in his uh, Comets debut. His I get, Sorry, I should say his pro debut this season um, because uh, he makes 19 saves on 20 shots against the Rochester Americans, who the Comets thumped. Seven to one, and I actually watched that game because it was free on Facebook today. And um, wow, the a- the AHL is uh, much different than the last time I covered it, uh, especially based on you know Cody. Uh, if you remember on our last one of our uh, our recent episodes, Cody talked about how it's a lot more ECHL guys uh, because of the taxi squad. Uh, the defense is a lot more um, is a lot has a lot more holes in it for the most part. The goaltending isn't always up to par. Uh, and it's going to be a much, it's a much more, uh, it's a much more chaotic affair right now because of all of those factors. And sure enough, Comets come in, wipe out Rochester 7-1. to There's a bunch of scrums, uh, lots of power play goals. Um, there was a very late, not great hit by Vinny Arsenault late in that game, uh, that, uh, injured, a, that injured an American. Uh, but DiPietro held solid, made some great saves. And there, and uh, you have, and it's great to see him back after over a year of not playing. He finally gets his chance again, and he makes it count. Um, he looks a lot uh, better uh, as opposed to you know this time last or that point last season, his last game. 
And uh, a lot of that has to be due to Ian Clark. He mentioned him in the post game that Ian Clark is the uh, is is the uh, has is the best goalie coach of all time. I believe. I think he said some. I think it was right. I think that that was the official quote. If I can go back and find it, something along the lines, uh, which is yeah, he's the best. In my this is from Chris Faber. Uh, in my opinion, he is the best goaltender coach in the world, and that's Mike DiPietro on Ian Clark. Um, Interest, and uh, of course, that comes out on the day that, uh, according to Kevin Woodley, there is buzz that Ian Clark would might be going to Philly next season, uh, or also possibly Toronto. Um, so, yeah, man, there is nothing good to talk about. Even when the good stories have something uh, just lousy attached to them, is there? You know, this is this was already going to be a short episode, just based on the fact that do we really like it's. I was already had to do this episode on my, by my by myself today, and just again couldn't watch the first game really, uh, other than the highlights, because of the fact that uh, it was at a a two thirty afternoon start. Why? I don't understand that at all. I guess there was a late Wednesday night game that they had to make room for on the broadcast schedule. I guess, but I don't two thirty p.m. on a Wednesday. I'm so mad about that. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Uh, very poor scheduling, uh, as far as that game is concerned. Um, I guess if you wanted to hide people from the disaster that it ended up being, maybe well done, I guess. Um, but again, couldn't watch that game. And I was coming into this episode just like, oh, I'm really dreading talking about this. Like, talking about these two games where the Canucks just looked so dead in the water, they could not keep up with the worst team in the division by at all for two straight games and and then the and then of course the best even the and of course the best team had wanted nothing to do with them either it was just a, they were just a fly on the leaf shoulder so what do we talk about today for the most part is kind of my quest was kind of my question going into this um but um you know we've already been at this for 30 minutes i won't keep it much longer but we do have two more things to go over before we call this an episode starting with the playoff p- picture because it's getting a lot clearer toronto has its playoff spot clinched up obviously we already know that um uh since the i believe since the last time we recorded uh or actually this happened on the day of the florida panthers and the tampa bay lightning both clinched a playoff spot in the central tampa you expected that was coming that was a mile down the road. We knew that was going to happen. Florida, on the other hand, was not. 71 points. They're only two points back of the of the division-leading Hurricanes. And that is huge. I am I can't tell you how thrilled I am that the Panthers are in the playoffs. I love the Panthers. They're such a fun... Uh, they're such a... Like, uh, there's very like a lovable losers element to them. Uh, that I quite enjoy, um, and they've they've really earned their way to these playoffs this year. This was uh, not a fluke by any stretch for them. They played some incredible hockey down the stretch, even whilst they dealt with injuries like Aaron Ekblad, like losing Aaron Ekblad, uh, Sergei Bobrovsky not necessarily playing uh, up to that. Uh, what is it? That insane ten million dollars? Is it ten million that he's making per year? Uh, that cap hit. But uh, luckily, stepping into the fold, Chris Drieger and Spencer Knight have been fantastic for them. Uh, yep, ten million a year. Oh boy. Oh, Sergey, buddy, Bob, what's a <laughs> rough day for Bob? Um, they they earned this so much. They and that franchise as a whole has worked so hard just to win. I just want to see them win one playoff series. Is that too much to ask? I hope not. Um, and right now, from the looks of the, if things stay the way they do, and I really hope they do, um, we would get a Florida-Tampa fi- uh, first round of the playoffs, which is honestly such a dream matchup. Uh, the battle of the sun of the Sunshine State never happened in the playoffs before. It would be the very first time, and I am so here for it. The Jersey matchup would be great. The storylines would be awesome. I've watched some of their games this year, uh, the games between those two teams this year, and it has been good hockey, intense. Like, there's an actual sense of a rivalry there for the first time ever. Like, what a potential to be the best matchup of the first round of the playoffs, hands down. 
I am so hopeful that it sticks that way, especially with Florida holding home ice advantage. I want that so badly. I want to see the Panthers make it into the playoffs and play the Lightning in the first round and win. That's what I want to see. I really hope that happens for them. And I hope that they get that Carolina makes it to the second to the second round as well. So I get my an even more of a dream Florida Carolina uh, division final. Uh, just two of my favorite teams in the league going at it uh, for an, for a series would be fantastic to see. Um, please make that happen. Please please let that happen. Uh, Eastern Division, please hold. Please hold as as is. Is that the Eastern Division or is that the Central? Um, where are my standings? Central Division, excuse me. Uh, and right now there is still a bit, and there's a huge gap between all the team, those, those three teams and fourth, uh, the fourth place Predators with 56 points. The Predators, holy, came out of nowhere to actually kind of be in the playoff race right now. Good for them. Um, but they're just holding off Dallas at this point. Uh, and that's kind of the, that's the real question is, uh, can they hold off Dallas and hold on to that final fourth? I don't think so. I think the Stars are going to end up coming back and taking that one, uh, taking that fourth and final spot, which Dallas, and hey, Dallas Canes would be a very good series within its w- within its own right. I would love to see that as an option. Um, I just don't think Nashville is going to hang on. I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen for them. Um, in the West, uh, we've already talked about the three teams that have the, that have it locked in, um, and then you throw the Coyotes into the mix. They did win tonight, three nothing over the Golden Knights, which is stunning to say the least. But um, they're a few points back. They're kind of in. They're just kind of looking. They've been kind of slowing down of late. The momentum hasn't been there for them. I think it's St. Louis's position to lose in that case. And so, uh, but you never know. I would. I. Uh, I would prefer to. I would. Would I prefer to see Arizona? Probably not. I think the Blues play a more entertaining game. Actually, the Coyotes are a boring team. They didn't go. At, they didn't make any moves at the trade deadline, which was the wrong decision in my opinion. They should be the team that should have gone for it harder because this was going to be their best opportunity for a while to make it in, and they wasted it. So never mind. They don't deserve to make it in. I hope not. Uh, St. Louis, hold on to that, even if that means I have to watch Jordan Binnington in the playoffs. Um. And last but certainly not least, we'll talk about the Mass Mutual East Division. Uh, Washington uh, and Pittsburgh both clinched their tickets today, or in the last couple days. I um, I honestly will say I'm stunned that Pittsburgh's back in the playoffs. That is one of the biggest surprises of the season to me. I thought they really had... I thought they were stale. I thought they were done, uh, especially after the way they went out last year... Uh, they bowed out to the Canadians in that uh, that qualifier series. I really thought they were cooked and that they were going to need to really do a proper retool before they were going to get back to the postseason. But, hey, they came back this year, did pretty decently, and they're now tied for the for first in that division. Maybe that's just a, uh, maybe that's just a matter of that division not being super great. But they've... Uh, hats off to them. Hats off to... Uh, uh, the management team and the coaching staff there who has gotten them to play, I would argue, play above their weight class. I guess, you know, any team with Crosby and Malkin has the aspirations and the potential to be a playoff, to be a good playoff team and make the playoffs. But I really didn't see this coming. I was absolutely on the Pittsburgh is going to miss the postseason this year. There's too many good teams in that division. There's no way they make it this time around. Uh, I was very much had that uh, mentality. So, and they proved me wrong. Good for them. They proved they totally proved me wrong. Good for them. Um, the Islanders holding third, the Bruins holding fourth, and um, the Rangers, I think, still have a chance of possibly making it. They're running out of time, though, uh, with only four games left in their season. They put up a very valiant effort, especially for a young team that's really um, just, uh, just starting to develop uh, into their own. This was not the year necessarily that they were going to make a playoff push. Um... Uh, but it's coming for them. They're getting closer. They're definitely getting closer. Next season, there's going to be the expectations are going to be a lot higher. I think, I think they're going to be a a, for a pretty formidable opponent down the line. This year just wasn't their year. Uh, there's just too many good teams in front of them again. Um, the one team that has been surprising uh, as far as their year is Philadelphia. Won the division last year. Eliminated from playoff contention this year. 
Uh, currently, they have twenty. They have a twenty-two wins, twenty-one losses, and seven overtime losses for fifty-one points. Eliminated from contention, and Carter Hart uh, was shut down for the season earlier this week uh, with a torn MCL, or sorry, not a torn MC, or an MCL sprain. I believe it was the official language uh, used. Yeah, an MCL sprain. They've shut him down for the year. It was a very tough year for Carter Hart, and as and that was kind of how their season died. Like Carter Hart had just an abysmal year, completely just um, could not hold it down. Like so many times, got blown out, had really really tough outings. It just wasn't there for him this year. And maybe that's because they burnt him out last season. I don't know. Remember exactly how many games off the top of my head that he played. Maybe I can, and but maybe I can figure that out as we chat here. But the Flyers were a team that was supposed to be uh, just hitting, just strolling into their cup window uh, with all the young talent they have, like Travis Konechny and uh, and uh, Sean Couturier, and you go, and even like the older vets like um, uh, Claude Giroux and Jakub Voracek. Uh, they're supposed to be a team that's really that's uh, had just opened that was just opening their opportunity to really start doing some damage in the postseason, and they couldn't hold they couldn't they couldn't hold the fort down. They just couldn't. They just they could not hold on. And um, this year, Carter Hart just uh, could not. And Carter Hart had a lot to do with that. Uh, in eight seventy seven save percentage over twenty seven games. Uh, Part of that clearly might have been due to injury, but it wasn't there for him. And I hope he bounces back next year. I want to see him come back with a much better season next year, um, as long as uh, that's not because Ian Clark uh, gets hired by the Flyers. I would rather that not happen. So, uh, oh my God, Canucks make that man an offer. You have to. You absolutely have to. Um, Philadelphia, I don't know what to tell, tell you. Uh, hopefully you get back next season. Uh, especially because again, I think they're, the the sport is worse off when they don't make the playoffs, uh, because of just how many good young players they have on that team. And one and as far as goaltenders are concerned, there is one last story to talk about. And um, if you as and if you can tell by the jersey sitting behind me, uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, uh, you know who we're about to talk about here, and that's Ryan Miller, uh, who retired from who announced his retirement at the uh. As soon, uh, yeah, this this week, this would have been yesterday. Um, compared to, uh, and he will finish out the year with the Ducks, and that'll be it for him. Uh, the winningest goaltender in Amer, winningest goalie, it, American-born goalie in NHL history. Uh, played numerous seasons with the Sabers. Of course, he was a, the face of the franchise for a very long time there. Um, played a, a brief a brief tr- post trade deadline stint with the Blues. Uh, before, of course, before of course joining the Canucks for three years and then finishing his career with four seasons in Anaheim, Ryan Miller is a goaltender who I loved watching, and he is one of my favorite players of all time, uh, at least as far as like the players who I was lucky enough to see play. Um, Miller was never like the most uh, like animated player. He was never the most like gung ho. As far as a goaltender is concerned, he was a much more quiet, reserved, I'm going to make the saves kind of guy. And very cool as a cucumber in a lot of situations. Sometimes would speak his mind and he'd do it at the right possible time. Of uh, Like when he uh, called out Milan Lucic uh, once. That was that was incredible. Uh, Wyatt Art had a, uh, the stanchion on, for the Athletic had a great, in the armies uh, yesterday, had a great uh, little, uh, I guess, eulogy for... Uh, Miller's career, uh, just talking about what a what an important what a treat it was to have him in Vancouver and how much he meant to that organization and the and to the organization in the three years he was here. And I wrote something very similar uh, a few uh, when he left for Anaheim the first time. Um, I talking about just how what an underrated player he was for this team uh, for the years that he was here. And I'll pull it up on the video feed now. Like just pull up a little bit of a clip at uh, a look at it. Um, Ryan Miller, to me, is a Canuck who you never got his due and was never going to get his due because he played for a team that wasn't as good as it could, uh, that wasn't good. Um, they had the one playoff year while he was there, but the rest of the year was very much retooling uh, and tanking. It was not a good team. And I think Miller, for what he provided that for this team and the stability in net that he offered, particularly 
in regards to buying time for Jacob Markstrom and and uh, Thatcher Demko to a certain extent as well. Um, the the time that he bought for them and by being as stable and fantastic in net as he was really did the Canucks such a solid and a huge favor. Um, he did a lot for this team for a guy who was only here for three years and, you know, n- never really sniffed a good shot at a Stanley Cup while he was here. Um, he is a goaltender who I think a lot of us in Vancouver, especially in particular, really, really got to know uh, during the 2010 Olympics, uh, in the 2010 Olympics when he was an absolute star for Team USA uh, that season, and or that that in that tournament, um, you couldn't get a puck by him. He was the best goaltender in that tournament. The second best goalie was Luongo. The first was him. He was absolutely lights out fantastic, and I was lucky enough to see him in one of those games. I was lucky to see enough to see him play the Swiss, uh, that the, the Swiss team. I think that would have been the first game of the tournament uh, for them as well, the round robin. Uh, he was rock solid. Uh, they would, they don't, the Americans don't come close to that silver medal without him. He was phenomenal. And then, and, you know, he, ne- there were, there were points where he just didn't get the, the credit he deserved because of the fact that he played on some teams that just weren't as good. Um, like, you know, the Sabres really started to go downhill, uh, right after he, uh, right as they traded him, they traded him off the team more or less. Uh, because the team was doing so poorly, it was time, they were like, okay, we're not going to make Miller sit through a rebuild because he's been such a loyal soldier for us, we're going to trade him to a contender. That ended up being St. Louis. Didn't work out long term, didn't work out long term, obviously, but the Canucks took care of him for three years. And I, I, I am, to this day, I am, I miss Ryan Miller. He was a fantastic goalie to have here. I think the Canucks uh, we're so lucky to have him for the years that they did. He really provided a proper stopgap between Luongo and Markstrom that was needed and clearly proven to be the right decision. I've given Jim Benning a lot of flack, obviously, on this show um, and in my writing before. Ryan Miller was a good call. That was his best signing to this day. What, in my opinion, is the best signing he ever made, hands down. Uh, everything he did for this team, and I think he never got the credit he was due, not just because of the fact that he wasn't as good, but because he wasn't necessarily the most charismatic guy, like I mentioned before. Like, Roberto Luongo wasn't at necessarily super charismatic when he started in Vancouver, but by the end he was Strombone 1, with all the tweets and just the jokes, and such a funny guy to be around, making, like, my contract sucks, the poetry, everything. He was a fan fantastic just character by the time he was by the time he left the Canucks in 2014 uh, and Eddie Lack same deal uh incredible social media presence uh had always had jokes and quips and was always interacting with the fans uh, and one of the few players that did and he became a fan favorite in in Vancouver because of it to the point where people were clamoring for him to start games over Miller uh because of just because of how much they loved him even though I personally was like, I don't think he's the better goaltender. I, I always felt that Miller was the better call. Um, and come playoff time, Eddie Lack was the one who started four ga- the first four games of that series before Miller came in in game five. Um, and that was those last two games were the last two uh, chances he got. Uh, he got in Vancouver at the postseason in the postseason. And um, I, I, he never got that due just because he wasn't as charismatic and fun as the other two goaltenders before, as the other two major goalies who'd come before him. And I think that was always kind of, and I, that was always too bad because he was such a great leader for that team. And what he, and those, and what he provided to that locker room is nothing short of incredible. He was, he helped uh, defend Troy Stetcher from Matt Martin, uh, completely gooning it up and uh, sucker punching him and like completely jumping him in the, behind the net. Uh, one of my favorite moments, uh, uh, from that era uh, is Ryan Miller rushing in to just start uh, kicking Matt Martin's ass. I loved it. Fantastic. Uh, just a great all-around, an all-around great teammate who backed up, who backed up his play, uh, who backed up his words with his, with great play, and man, could those seasons have been a lot darker if not for him. He did everything he could to make that team better and more competitive. 
And I when and I was so thrilled when he went to Anaheim, when he signed with Anaheim after that three year deal was up. Because I wanted to see him go win a cup. I that at the time the Ducks were one of the best teams in the league, and I really thought he was gonna go get his his Stanley Cup there. And I wanted him to go get it. Him and uh him playing with Bieksa and Kessler to a certain extent. I was like, yes, please, go win a Stanley Cup with Anaheim. He took less money, from my understanding, than the Canucks offered him for another couple years uh, to go play in Anaheim, and I cannot fault a guy ever for doing that. If you're going to take less money to go play for in, for a Stanley Cup, hell yeah, all the power to you. That's a very noble cause, and you go for it. I was thrilled to see him move on from the team and get and try and go get his chance at finally lifting his championship. He never did get it. But maybe that'll be next for him. Maybe in the next uh, life as far as uh, where he goes from here, whether that's management or coaching. uh, He's definitely talked about it uh, over the last couple days. He talked about wanting to uh, possibly move into front office stuff and try give it a shot. So, and I hope that he gets his chance. I hope he gets his chance at a championship someday. I'd love to see him hoist a Stanley Cup, uh, whether that's on the ice or in a suit. Um, Ryan Miller... Thank you so much for the great hockey you provided uh, the NHL with for so many years. One of my all-time favorites. Um, And that feels like the best way to close up this episode. It's a a happy story with a, hopefully with a happy ending. We'll get an, I'm sure we'll get a chance to see him play a few more games before the end of the year. I'll be watching those games for sure. And I hope you will too. And um, with that, uh, this has been the crease cast for Friday, uh, April 30th. Uh, as we enter round the corner into the final stretch of the Canucks season. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, make sure to check out our, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, if you, make sure you uh, give us a like on this video if you're watching the video version. And hit that subscribe button and the, tap the bell icon to get notified when new episodes come out. Uh, we, and make sure to give us a, leave us a review on all your look on your local social on your on your uh, podcast platform of choice it really helps us out especially on apple we might showcase some of them if you if you uh leave a review make we might uh we might shout them out in in a future episode so definitely uh look out for that and you can subscribe to us on all sorts of uh podcast platforms out there um you can follow myself on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Lock in the Crease. And you can check out my work at LockinTheCrease.com where I write the North Division Power Rankings every Sunday. And uh, definitely make sure you're following those social media platforms if you're not already. Um, all of them. Uh, absolutely all of them. Because uh, on Monday, I'm going to be doing some uh, some pretty cool, some pretty neat uh, stuff uh, that day. Uh, in regards to the Vancouver Canucks that, uh, you will definitely want to be, uh, keeping an eye on Instagram. I usually do stories when I cover games live. Like, uh, I cut, I take video from the press box. That's the sort of, I do that sort of stuff. Uh, there'll definitely be lots of pictures and whatnot, uh, for you to chew on, uh, as well as the article that I end up writing. So, uh, definitely make sure you're following on all of my platforms this, the, uh, this, this time around this week, uh, before Monday. And uh, as far as Cody is concerned, uh, you can go follow him on Twitter at Cody Sievertson. You can follow him on Instagram at Comets Harvest. And you can go read his work at CometsHarvest.com, where he already has a full recap of today's game against the Rochester Americans. Already up uh, and ready for your enjoyment. Uh, we retweeted it on the CreaseCast Twitter plat- on Twitter account. You can go find it there. Oh yeah, check out the CreaseCast Twitter account. We have that as well, at the CreaseCast. We're also on Instagram at uh, at cre- at the creasecast and facebook at just creasecast no the the other two instagram and twitter are the creasecast facebook is just creasecast um and that is it for this episode thank you so much for for listening and we'll be back on tuesday uh with a whole lot of stories to tell i am sure whether or not this weekend goes the way it's planned to for the canucks standpoint i can guarantee you next episode is going to be a one of the mo- the best episodes of the year and i can say that with full sincerity we'll be back on tuesday good night